with uh, this segment, we begin our uh, treatment of uh, problems in multiple dimensions. And we're going to go straight away to three dimensions here. The problem we'll start out with is uh, in the context of the mathematical description of PDEs, uh, also a linear elliptic PDE in three dimensions, uh, with the further specification that the unknown we are solving for is a scalar. Okay? So, that's what I'm going to write out, and we'll start with it. So we're now looking at um, linear elliptic PDEs in three dimensions. Okay, uh, with scalar unknowns or scalar unknown, right? Where it's a single unknown we are solving for. So linear elliptic PDEs, three dimensions, scalar unknown, right? Um, the canonical problems that are the canonical physical problems that are that are described by uh, this sort of uh, PDE. Uh, include uh, heat conduction, right? Steady state heat conduction. And also at steady state, the mass diffusion problem. All right. Okay. Um, we'll plunge right into it. We'll start out with the strong form. Okay. So the strong form of the problem we're looking at is the following. Um, So um, let me do this. Before I start writing out the strong form, uh, let me just um, write, sketch out the domain that we're trying to solve things on. Just as for the 1D linear elliptic problem, we sketched out this, um, this idea of a bar sort of embedded in a wall, um, right, fixed in a wall. So let me do that. Now, because we're doing things in 3D, we um, are going to make use of um, vector notation, all right? So we have here what I will refer to as our basis vectors, right? And these will be denoted by E1, E2, E3, okay? Note that the notation I use uh, for vectors is to put an uh, underbar Right on them. Um, that's that's just the convention I follow. When we get to needing tensors, I will do the same thing, and we will simply distinguish between vectors and tensors by context. Okay. So the domain we are interested in is a um, some arbitrary domain, and I will draw what, in the context of continuum physics, is often referred to as the continuum potato. All right. So we have that here. Uh, the domain of interest here is uh, labeled omega, as before, except that omega now lives in 3D. Okay? So um, let me uh, write out things here. EI, where I equals 1, 2, and 3, right? The set EI, where I equals 1, 2, 3, um, constitutes... an orthonormal um, Cartesian basis. All 
Okay? Do you recall what orthonormality means? The ortho refers to perpendicular and normal refers to unit magnitude. Okay? Um, so what that means is that if we look at EI dotted with EJ, this is equal to delta IJ, where delta IJ is the Kronecker delta. Okay? And you remember what the particular properties of the Kronecker delta are, right? Where delta IJ equals uh, 1 for i equals j equal to 0 for i not equal to j. Okay? And we note that this directly um, covers the orthonormality property, right? Because if i is equal to j, it says that each of these e's, e1, e2, e3, is of unit magnitude, right? And if i not equal to j, it tells us that they are perpendicular to each other. Okay, so that's what is implied, and here I will make it more obvious by doing this. Okay, so these are perpendicular to each other. All right, um, Cartesian for our purposes simply means that they are fixed, right? The, the basis vectors do not change, right? They are fixed in space, all right? Um, let me also just uh, for uh, the purpose of making this completely obvious, state that we are doing all of this in three-dimensional ambient space. Okay, so this is the setting for the problem we want to consider. I have some props to help us through the rest of these lectures. Um, that represents uh, our basis, right? You, you can think of this as E1, E2, E3. Uh, each of these are, is of unit magnitude and they are, of course, perpendicular to each other. The domain of interest to us is this one, okay? This is our representation of the continuum potato. It happens to, a, to be a University of Michigan NERF, um, well, not NERF, but a University of Michigan foam football, all right? Uh, but, but this is the domain over which we will be describing everything happening. Uh, and um, this is omega for our purposes, all right? Um, the, the other thing that we will need about omega is uh, we will, we will uh, repeatedly use the, refer to its boundary. Right? So omega is, uh, as before with our domains, omega is an open set. Right? So when I talk about omega, I don't include its boundary. Right? Uh, we will use certain notation for the boundary of omega. So let's put down that bit <coughs> of notation. The boundary is uh, going to be denoted partial of omega. That does not um, imply that we're taking anything like a derivative. It's for our purposes, it's just notation. All right. Um, okay, so that's pretty much what we need to begin with. Okay, so yeah, maybe I should just say one more thing here. Omega is open in R3. And um, if this is the first time you're encountering it, I will also say that partial of omega is the boundary of omega. Okay, so this is the setting we have, all right? In this setting, what we are trying to do is the following. Um, let's state the strong form. We are interested in finding some function u, okay? Um, Find u given some other quantities, okay? So we are going to be given f again. Uh, f, uh, as before, is a function of position, except that now position is a position vector, okay? It's uh, going to be denoted as x, all right? And, um, okay, at the risk of going back and forth, let me just add one more thing to that figure I had on the previous uh, slide. I am going to say that some point x here 
has a position vector, right? So that's the position vector of point x. In the context of uh, our props, okay, so we're talking of uh, the position vector from the origin of this uh, Cartesian basis to some arbitrary point in this uh, domain, right, in our continuum potato in omega, okay? So, so, okay, so we remember that this is where the basis is. We're talking of the vector from here to there, okay? So that, that is what we, we, we have in mind. I could use this as a prop, right? So if, 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 if the tail of the spin, the top of the spin is where the Cartesian basis was and we want to talk about this um, point, we have that. Okay, so that's the Cartesian vector, sorry, that's the position vector for x. Okay, um, right. So we need that because we want to talk uh, about um, the dependence of this forcing function, right? So the forcing function is a function of x, it's, it's parameterized by x, uh, it uh, can be defined at, at, uh, at any point over the domain. So we're given f, uh, f of x, as before we are given um, u sub g, all right, uh, and we are given um, j sub uh, n, okay? We're also given the constitutive relation We're given the constitutive relation that I will initially write using what is called indicial or coordinate notation, okay? We are given a constitutive relation J sub i equals minus kappa i j u comma j, okay? All right. Um, where, again, since this is sort of the first time I'm writing it out, I'm going to tell you that i comma j equals 1, 2, 3. All right? We're given all of this, right? Um, right, so we want to find you, given all this, this information, such that such that, again, sticking with coordinate notation, um, minus j i comma i equals f in omega, all right? And um, we also have boundary conditions right, BC for boundary conditions, U equals U sub G on partial of omega sub U and minus J dot N equals J sub N on partial of omega sub j. Well, that's our strong form. Now, obviously, I have a lot of explanation to do here, right? I've introduced all kinds of uh, terms, and I haven't really, and I need to ma make them clear. Let's begin, um, let's begin with something that we already know. Uh, let me say, let me tell you more about what, what I mean by decorating the boundary with the subscripts u and j, all right? So, we have our basis again. This is something that I'm going to end up drawing repeatedly, at least over the next couple of segments. Okay, we have E1, E2, E3. We have our uh, domain omega, right? And now, uh, the boundary is partial of omega, and rather than mark it as partial of omega, I'm going to tell you what partial of omega u and partial of omega j could be. Let us look at um, that, um, actually, let me make that an open interval, sorry. 
Let me look at that integral, right? So that would mean all the points that um, lie uh, between those two braces if you were to just walk around the walk around the boundary, right? That is what I may choose to call partial of omega u. And the complement, right, of that set is what I'm calling partial of omega j, all right? What this simply means is that we've taken our um, boundary and partitioned it into disjoint subsets uh, such that um, they're disjoint, like I just said. So partial of omega u intersection partial of omega j is the empty set. Okay, phi here denotes the empty set, uh, this symbol denotes intersection. Okay, so the intersection of these two um, subsets is empty and uh, partial of omega is uh, always written as partial of omega u union partial omega j. All right. So really, if you think about the way we've uh, marked out these boundary subsets, I've just chosen to make partial of omega u um, open. But that means that partial of omega j is closed, right, in order to make sure that we don't lose the boundary points between partial omega u and partial omega j, right? Um, right? And, and of course, their union uh, gives us the total boundary, partial omega. Okay, just a way of, sp of splitting up the, the boundary. And then what we're saying is when we go back to these boundary conditions, what we're saying is that we have, uh, we've specified u equals ug on uh, one part of the boundary. Okay, and actually let me take off this brace bracket. If we're specifying u equals ug on some part of the boundary, what kind of a boundary condition is that? Recall from our treatment of the problem in one dimension? That's right, that is the Dirichlet boundary condition. Right? And the other term, the other boundary condition is our Neumann boundary condition. All right? Okay, so uh, this is what we mean by the boundaries, right? Uh, by the boundary subsets and the boundary conditions. Let's go back uh, now and talk about the other quantity we introduced here without much, um, without much fanfare, J, right? 